Almighty. <laughs> oh, I was so scared. Because I, I didn't know it. And there'd been all this sort of control. Oh, you shouldn't do it. You're going to ruin a fucking legend of Christ. And you're going to do this. And you're a bastard. <laughs> So I got there the first night, I thought, I'll be playing here two nights, right? And the bloody place, that was 2,000 people. Oh, fuck, you know. And uh, I thought, it, it's going to be that horrible thing where, you know, you go on stage and there's all lights and everyone's ready and there's like 10 people in front. And then you finish the first song and all you hear is like, whoop! <laughs> <laughs> and then in the back, they'd be, <laughs> I thought it's going to be like that. No, it, 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 uh, the most thing was, I walked out there and it's a, a huge roar went out and all I could see was just smiling faces. Just people smiling, uh, and it was fantastic. It's one of the most moving things I've ever done, I think. And you had flux of pink Indians there, you oh, had. Oh, that, that really put a lump in my throat because Coles, when, when flux split, Colin Latter, the lead singer, he swore that he would never reform uh, flux, but he did it especially because of, of that gig, and that really put a lump in my throat, that one. That, yeah, top man, mate. So you can't give it up. You gotta, you gotta do this. You gotta, because crass is a beautiful, mysterious thing. Those of us who grew up through it, it was, it was our way out of the normal society. And, um, but there's also the music. There's also the songs, yeah. and to feel those songs. I've been playing them the last few weeks in anticipation of you coming. And they just hold up so well. They speak to today so well. And do you feel that way? Do when you get out there, do you feel like, I'm saying things that like, I don't, I don't imagine you know this, but in America, we, we definitely feel that sense. There's a wonderful quote in your book about how um, the idea is the people who have the money are very happy taking away society from us and however we can take that back from them and live the lives that we want to live is the most important thing to do. Yeah. Well, the, the funny thing is with the crash songs, although they were written of a time, about a time, they've got this funny timeless thing about them. You know, so even though we do, uh, you know, maybe we'll do How Does It Feel to Be a Mother of Thousand, maybe it's about Falklands War. That could be about any war. You know, and all right, we're talking about Margaret Thatcher, but you just, you know, I, I haven't changed any names because these are the Christ songs and I'm presenting them, we are presenting them the way that they were, they were done. Um, but you can put your own politician in there. Um, but the funny thing is, if those Christ songs were written tomorrow, I don't think they'd have the same impact because this thing called the internet. It's really, it, I, I know it's this really bizarre thing because look, the way, the way Christ always saw themselves was like we was an information bureau almost. And we'd, uh, you know, like, um, we, were, we were playing to, you know, in these out of the way places um, that no one else ever went to, to these really young kids. And they'd be saying to us, uh, what's, what's the ND? What's the campaign for nuclear zone? What's, what's nuclear? Da -da? So we'd explain that and then we'd put out information. Put out from, nowadays, if you do it, I'll tell you what, I'm going to do a song about, um, I'm going to do a song about anything. Oh, Steve, I Googled it last night and I know about it, mate. Oh, I'm going to do a song about, um, you know, politicians, but yeah, well, I Googled it last night. <laughs> no, I'm going to do, I'm going to do a 12 important. Yeah, I made a record in my bedroom last night, Steve. So, <laughs> you know, it, 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 I, it's really funny. I don't think it'd be the same. I, I don't know, you know. I'm going to disagree. There's a book out now called 33 Revolutions. It's a beautiful, thick book about the greatest protest songs. I'm 33. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're wonderful, and you got some great quotes. Penn's got some great quotes. Think about it. How does it feel is in there? And if you could think about the impact in the UK, thank you very much. Uh, if you could think of the impact in the UK of uh, the challenger to Margaret Thatcher had come up and, and quoted this, the lyric from the song in order to remind her of the, of the thousand dead in the Falklands. And uh, how does it feel like became total instant political action all over the UK? And, and, and uh, did you ever find out what Maggie thought of Crass? Did she ever give a quote? Uh, no, because what she did, what her cabinet did, was to send around a circle to all the, all the conservative uh, politicians and said, on no account must anyone from the Tory party have any dealings with uh, or with anyone pertaining to know anything about a certain band called Crass. Wow. Yeah, so from, and then from that point on, there was complete media blank for us. That sounds like a victory. <laughs> well, yeah, but, it was, yeah, but it, was, it, was, it was also really scary um, because, we, you know, once you start ratting those bloody pages, it's, it, that, that gets dark then, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, I started, when I was going to the pub, you know, I'd come out and I'd, I'd look over both shoulders, you know, because if you make too much, they are going to get rid of you. Well, yeah, I mean, John, uh, John Lennon had gone, you know, um, and people would call me, like, Steve, and I wouldn't fucking turn around. Uh, you know, and, uh, and there's all these conspiracy things going on. 
and how easy would it be if you come to too much of a pain in the arsehole, you want to get rid of Steve Ignorant, right, you wait till he comes out of pub pierced, right, smack him on the head, back of the car, dump him out of the way, stick a needle in his arm, put some pin bricks in there, he's got to give him an overdose, he's got to fucking know. So, and that's when I got a bit scary and I didn't like it then, because it, it weren't fun no more. The dial house was full of people. You had people staying there all the time. Yeah. You had a, an alcohol ban, which shouldn't, mustn't have been fun for you at that time. And so you, you had to be on your best behavior in a way. You had to be perfect. And yet you had all this, you had the obscenity board come by about reality asylum, and that was starting early on. But yeah. then, but you have all this government pressure, and, and you had this pressure to be, you know, a good guy in the middle of all those people. Well, I wasn't a good guy. I mean, I, you know, I mean, what the reason, look, the no alcohol thing and no drugs was that, you know, we had an open door thing and yeah, you could come and stay there, but you had to respect it was our home, you know, and so, and people had sort of split on saying, we don't do that anymore because that's the, if we, if the police came for it, which they did on a weekly basis, how stupid would it be to get shut down because of one sort of split? So no drugs, you know, do it outside, you know, do a bit of squeak. And with the alcohol thing, we, we didn't want people turning up and getting pissed and breaking things, you know, and also. So what I used to do was go out and do it. So I certainly wasn't a good, well, I, well, you know, well, I was just a normal young bloke, having fun, you know, sort of doing what young blokes do, which is birds, booze, and prop Chris, we need to probably maybe take a few questions in the audience and then, so Steve has time to sign books and talk to people. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to get you to sign books. Absolutely. Get the book. You're going to love it. Okay. I think it's one in lumps of ice. <coughs> what's the most when we first heard Crass was this like, holy shit, what is this moment, you know? And then as time goes on, you know, we, 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 we hear about this heritage and like the avant-garde and the jazz and, you know, the political scene that led up to it and the context we found myself in. Looking back now, but I mean, obviously you got something, some new combination at least. Looking back now, like, what do you think it was that was sort of like that? And the, the, also, like, the DIY thing, looking back, it seems like that was like an originary moment. But was it, do you feel like you just found all these elements that were there and combined them at the right time, or was there some new spark in the idea that, like... No, I, I think it's just because we weren't musicians, and, um, you know, as I say, Pen had three different drum beats, Pete might add a couple of bass rhythms that he used, you know, and we just made this noise to go with the words. And, um, and then G came up with, with her sort of you know, um, collage idea. Um, and the DIY thing really came about was because our, our take on it, and certainly mine was, you know, look, you know, if I want to buy the Sex Pistols album, I've only got a five pound note in my pocket, so what do I do, buy a pack of cigarettes or buy the album? Why can't I have both? And so that was our take on it, let's make it cheap enough so that they can, they can buy the record and have a can of beer with it as well, get pissed and enjoy it, and that was always our take on it. And, uh, but that got sort of taken up as, you know, subsequent bands came along and uh, then sort of, again, out crash crash on the DIY scene. And then it was like, oh, bloody hell, you know, now we can't have milk in our tea because there's these things called vegans now. <laughs> <laughs> and it literally was like that a lot of the time, you know, so, yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> Jeff? Yeah, um, I have a question about influences. Um, Chris pointed out correct, uh, correctly that um, Crass was a major influence on the American uh, hardcore punk scene in the early 80s. Um, but I'm wondering how much, whether there was any reciprocity there, whether people in the Crass collective circa 1980, can you hear me from American hardcore? Did you hear anything going on here at the same time? Uh, yeah. No. Uh, uh, well, we got involved with NBC, and once they started coming over, and obviously, you know, uh, Dead Kennedys and stuff like that, but we were so busy doing our own thing that, you know, I must admit we didn't take much notice of it. Um, you know, I'd, I'd go along to see us, like, Crucifix and bands like that, you know, when they came over, um, Black Flag and all that sort of stuff, Minor Threat, you know, and you'd cash in, but really, we were so busy doing what we were doing, we didn't have time, you know. Um, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, uh, Roy? Stupid question. Um, <laughs> you and Penny were the primary lyricists, is that correct? Who wrote the songs that uh, the women sang, or was that you and Penny as well? Or was it a case where there was a vocalist group and the uh, Well, some of the ones on Penis Envy, uh, Penny, Penny wrote a couple of those with Eve Libertine, but mostly they were done by G, they were done by the women in the band. Good. But, uh, so. Poison and the Pretty Pill, who Poison and the Pretty Pill. Poison and the Pretty Pill. Joy, I think that was Joy Devive. Joy Devive. Yeah. 
Now, who is Carol Hodges? You got her, her doing uh, the vocals from Peanuts and B on she's, this turn. She's singing a song. And you, you auditioned for her, right? Hey, it's going to be good to see you tonight. Carol Hodges. Yeah. 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 All right, show that, right? <laughs> Were you in any other bands before uh, you, you auditioned? Were you in any, uh, in any other bands before you auditioned? Yeah, quite a few, yeah. Um, I was learning about the Dante's Barbies. There's nothing like Krauss. So. <laughs> Anybody else? Did you ever see any, any of the money that was made off the thousands and thousands of Krauss t-shirts that were sold in yeah. the United States? And so I always wondered, how did that disconnect happen between the DIY thing that you guys were doing records and the products and all that stuff proliferated in the U.S., especially in the 90s, because it was like, I felt like as a as a punk in the 90s, a Crass t-shirt was like an entry point that everyone had at that point, and then I read later that you guys never saw any of that, or, so no. I, I, I always wondered, like, how did that happen? What happened there? Well, we didn't really know. I mean, our, our take on it was that, um, you know, look, if you want a T-shirt, make it yourself. You know, I thought that's, that's what this punk was meant to be about. You know, do it yourself. And so we never, we never sold T-shirts. We never made them. I kept saying we should do it because maybe we can pay the rent. Uh, but you know, no, we wouldn't have it. Um, and to be honest, we didn't even realise that we were that global. You know, we knew we had a few fans in, in American stuff. And it, uh, and it wasn't until a few years ago when this thing called the, the internet came out. That you know, some people like, I, well, I was like, ah, kid, hell, you know, there's a whole bloody industry going around there. Because, you know, we had this naive idea that, you know, some people say, oh, is it all right if we make a, if we, you know, produce a crash t shirt? Yeah, yeah, I think there's some kid in the garage sort of, you know, doing 20 with a silk screen. Of course, that kid in the garage doing something does a load of up. Now, that kid who's been in the garage now owns a store in Camden Town in London doing very well with four by four of his nice fucking flat and all this stuff. Um, and that's the way it went, you know, and it's the, you know, do I care? No, not really, I give a shit, you know, just don't buy the bloody things, you know. I mean, well, we're doing proper ones tonight, so buy them if you feel like it. Pay my rent, pay my rent. I'm joking. <laughs> but yeah, we just didn't know, you know, because we went into that, you know. It's, you know, we used to do it all ourselves and we thought, you know, and then anyway, after. Uh, I don't know, it just won't have thing, you know. One last one from the guy in the suit. You want to ask? Uh, I wanted to ask you about your career as a Punch and Judy performer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you look, know what it is, do you? Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Well, look, it started off. Thank Christ, I saw that film. Look, it started off crash finished, right? And I thought, I'll do the classic thing that a lead singer does, and I'll, I'll do a solo album. What want to do it on? I know, I'll do it on this thing I've been really interested in. So I start writing this album, right? Then, luckily, I see this film called Spinal Tap, where they're talking about, yeah, when we've done this, we should do that Jack the Ripper album. I was going to do a fucking film Jack the Ripper. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would have been awesome. I would have loved that. Yeah, I'd have been oh, fucked. Yeah, I'd have been fucked. Yeah. So, uh, and I thought, no, I can't do that. So I thought I'd do, a, I'd do it on something else that I really liked. And I remember as a kid, as a, they, um, every, year for the, for the working class kids, they used to have like magicians come around to your local park and like, and quite often a big punch and judy. And it used to scare the shit out of me and a lot of other kids, because so it really was scary. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll write about that. And I, I started researching it. Uh, and uh, and to give myself inspiration, I carved a Mr. Punch out of wood. So a bit like Mozart, when he was composing, he used to, he used to fold a napkin into points, you know, just to inspire him. That's why I did And uh, and I thought, well, I'll, you know, a lot of kids come to visit our house, so I made all the other characters so they could play with them when they come over. And I came and I made the booth, right? and, I thought, and I was like, and I'm, well, I might as well bloody do it then. So I, I, so I tried it, and, and I was pretty, I must admit, I was pretty good at it. And, um, but the more I researched it, the more I realised that, that um, although it's called Punch and Judy, it shouldn't be, it should be called Just Punch, because that's what it's about. And Punch is a, 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 an alcoholic, Hunchback cripple who basically beats everybody, um, and it and it was it wasn't designed for children; it was designed for adults. And and he wears the red and black, which is a, I didn't realise was Yannickus colours. And uh, and basically, it's about you know how do you you know it's about living your life in the way you want to. Um, 
And the more I researched it, like there was these odd little things in it, you know, there's, it's not used anymore now because it's more a children's show, but there's one part in the Victorian times where there used to be a blind, a blind beggar used to knock on Punch's door. And Punch would open the door and the blind beggar didn't realise the door was open because he's blind and he'd knock on Punch's nose. And Punch would say, why are you hitting me on the nose? And he'd say, I'm, I'm a blind beggar, I lost my, sands and, my sight in the sands of Egypt. Well, when the British were deployed against the Napoleonic forces in, in the 1800s, whatever, um, there used to be a sand fly that used to lay its eggs and it might make you go blind temporarily or full time. And if you got that, you, you weren't given any money, you just left a beggar in the street. Which then, I thought, that's so like when the Falklands War finished and, uh, and there was going to be a victory parade. But the people who had been injured with bits missing weren't allowed to take part because it might upset people. Well, war ain't a game of fucking cricket, old boy, is it? I mean, war is about getting bits blown off you, and that's what fucking happens. And um, anyway, sorry, I went off on one minute. <laughs> Bushead. But yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So I had a, yeah, I had a really good time doing it. I did it for about nine years. Um, so a lot of it was fun. But I always remember one time I came. I was doing this really working class kids show, and I went, "And where's Judy, boys and girls?" And this little voice popped up, "On the other hand, you cunt." <laughs> Well, I've got to stop now. Yeah. You... Wait, well, that means I'll get off stage and I'll get to drink beer as well. Yeah, get a beer. <laughs> yeah,